I want to introduce our first presenter, which is Leah Rogney, and she is a professor emerita. And she'll be talking to us about her research about Walter, who is a runaway slave from the Seward household. Thank you very much, Leah. It's all yours. Really glad to be here. And, uh, uh, and I'm sure that people have a varying knowledge about the Seward, Seward family. So some things you already know, some things you probably don't. But Late one night in uh, 2013, I got an email from my son with the subject line, we own slaves. Um, uh, idling on, on the internet that evening, he Googled the name of his fourth great grandfather, Israel Seward. So you do that too. You got a famous name or even your name, you Google it sometime, just see what comes up. So uh, Israel Seward was the first cousin of William Henry Seward, governor, senator, secretary of state, native of Florida, in the town of Warwick in the state of New York. Among the hits for Israel was an article from the New Jersey Herald, just down the street from you, in, in Newtown, New Jersey, telling of the 1815 escape of Walter Leonard, a young man who had enslaved my family, the family of Colonel John Seward, William Henry's grandfather, and my fifth great-grandfather. In that moment, seeing that email, that headline, the heroic family story of early colonists, pioneers, and politicians was displaced by a story of a family privileged by slavery, um, the unearned benefits of non-paid labor. And since that night, I've come to look at no family story, indeed no history of the United States, except through the lens of slavery and its consequences. This sent me on a search for the, fam the people enslaved by my family. Who were they? What were their lives like in slavery? What became of them? And can I find their descendants? Um, this search has taken me several times to New York where I've met some of my Seward cousins and uncovered details about participation in slavery by John Seward Jr., my fourth great grandfather, and John, Seward's, uh, John Jr.'s brother, Samuel Swayze Seward, physician, judge, farmer, merchant, benefactor, and the father of William Henry. Um, it, we know that William Henry, uh, we know him as the leading anti-slavery po po politician of the 1850s, who was passed over for the Republican nomination in 1860 in favor of Abraham Lincoln, the newer kid on the block, because of William Henry's out, outspoken anti-slavery speeches in Congress, and because delegates feared that he might lose his own state of New York because of his avid defense of immigrants, especially Irish Catholics. This is where politics comes in in an 18th century um, uh, and 19th century context, Sue. So, uh, William Henry, who was called Henry by his family, tells us in his autobiography that he felt more comfort among the slaves who lived in his family home than he did with his rather severe father. He also tells us he never heard his family say anything, uh, quote, to think the Negro was inferior to the white person, end quote. We know Henry and his wife, Frances, provided refuge in their home for escaped slaves when he was governor of New York and that they befriended Harriet Tubman. But we know little of the origin, identities, and destinies of the people, persons his family had enslaved. So my search has brought me a new awareness of the extent, nature, and longevity of slavery, slavery in the North. And this search has been um, humbling and anguishing. I weep whenever I meet new people in the record, such as the five unnamed slaves taken, never to see their own families again, in 1773 from New Jersey to Mississippi. Uh, they were taken from New Jersey to Mississippi by two brothers of um, William Swayze Seward, who were loyalists in uh, Morris County, New Jersey, and they um, uh, left in um, um, 1773, prior to the Revolutionary War, uh, taking five unnamed slaves with them. Um, Page two. Page two. Um, I also weep when I see, uh, read about ye a yellow boy named Joe Hamilton, who was bought at the age of four from the overseers of the poor in Pennsylvania, taken to Ohio and sold again to Daniel Seward, Henry's and my cousin. 
First, some personal context for my quest for information um, about the Seward family, um, my mother's family. We're always, we were always proud of our Seward blood. As soon as there was no longer a male heir uh, to carry on the surname, there's been someone in every generation with a given name Seward. Seward Miller, Seward Cosmark, Seward Rogney Jr., Seward Rogney Sr., Christopher Seward Rogney. Henry and I are first cousins, five generations removed. Our shared ancestor was John Seward Sr. of Hardiston, now Stockholm, New Jersey, Colonel of the Sussex County Militia in the Revolutionary War. I'm descended from Colonel John's son, John Seward Jr., and Henry from Colonel John's son, Samuel Swayze Seward. The New Jersey Herald article that sparked this research um, uh, on Walter uh, came from the story of Walter Leonard as narrated by, in the oral recount, account by Sarah Card, white servant girl of 16. Sarah told the story to her daughter who wrote it down sometime in the 1880s. Sarah said Walter came to visit one day in 1815 when she was working in the kitchen of John O. Ford, the owner of the Wyndham Forge near Franklin, New Jersey. John Jr. had sold Walter and some of his land to Ford in 1808. Walter told Sarah he was running away and was on his way to Granny Winnan's house nearby to get the freedom suit she was making for him. Um, Sarah told him she would prepare some food for him when he went to get his new suit. Walter told Sarah that Israel Seward was running for him, helping pave the way for the escape, providing papers, planning a route, giving him money, etc. The article said that teenagers Sarah, Walter, and Israel were close to the same age and had grown up together probably as playmates. Israel was Henry's first cousin, a few years older than he. After Walter's escape, Sarah didn't hear anything about him until about 1830 when Israel Seward came to see her. Sarah's daughter wrote, I quote, he told her Walter was living in Illinois and had married a girl half white like himself and was getting along nicely. He had learned the blacksmith trade and was saving money and Israel added, here's a present he sent you for helping him be a free, free man. It was a pretty black alpaca or wool dress which came in very good. So you see my mother was an abolitionist very early. The newspaper article sent me to the dog-eared classic Seward history compiled by a family member in 1948. And there it was. At the end of Colonel John's 1797 inventory of goods and chattel, quote, one black woman named Peg, 40 pounds. One black girl by name Diner, 30 pounds. One black boy, Walter, 25 pounds. <sighs> You know, to, to my shame, um, my examination of the family genealogy had always focused on my family in Southern Illinois, where they arrived just at, in 1819, just after Illinois statehood. And you know, whatever gets reinforced becomes the narrative. And for me, the story of the Sewards as pioneers on the plains, a family who were friends of Abraham Lincoln when he was an upcoming politician, um, overshadowed essentially occluded the story of the Seward's as slave owners in New Jersey or New York. John Seward Jr. left New Jersey with his family in 1815. After four years in Ohio, he and the family left in 1819 to settle in Illinois. So Walter left New Jersey at the same time as the Seward's did. He left behind Peg and Diner, who were probably his mother and sister. Why did Israel help him es escape? Why then? And why did, did his former enslavers keep in touch with him for, for at least 15 years after he escaped? The only answer I can come to is that they were related. For former enslavers to keep in touch with a runaway slave after 15 years, halfway across the continent, there has to be some connection. Was John Sr. or John Ju Ju Jr. Walter's father? How about Samuel or the two other Seward brothers? According to New Jersey law at the time, Walter would have stayed enslaved for the rest of his life. As the Seward family prepared to leave and head west, did they conspire to see what that Walter could accompany the family? Did Peg say to him, 
go with the Sewards. You have a chance to be a free man. The author of the New Jersey Herald wrote that she had found a Walter Leonard in the Illinois census of 1830. There's no other trace of him after that time. When I asked an Illinois historian for help in finding Walter, she said it would be difficult because it was not safe to be black in Illinois at the time. While slavery had been prohibited in the state's 1818 constitution, a series of elaborate legal machinations, exceptions, grandfathered practices, and euphemistic workarounds made Illinois, as one historian reported in 1901, as absolutely, as absolutely a slave state as was Mississippi. The historian was surprised to hear of Walter because she said, the Illinois Sewards were known to be anti-slavery. Perhaps she specul speculated the Sewards were keeping him safe. So I've been able to trace Walter to his freedom plus 15 years, but no further. What about Peg and Diner? I've also been able to trace them to their freedom. Peg was freed in 1816 in the will of Mary Swayze Seward, Colonel John's widow. She was living in the home of her son Samuel in Florida at the time of her death. I found no records for Peg since her freedom. Henry's grandmother also let Henry's grandmother, Mary Swayze Seward, also left um, an enslaved person named Rody, R-H-O-D-Y, to another grandson in Florida. We don't know if Rody was male or female, and this is the only mention in the record. I've been down the long rabbit hole of searching for descendants of this grandson for a story passed down about a Seward who helped a slave escape. No luck so far. Diner, spelled variously as Dinah or Diana, likely Peg's daughter and Walter's sister, was freed by Samuel Swayze Seward in Florida in 1820. Her manumission document, which I found among Samuel's papers in the uh, State Library in Albany, said that she grew up in my household, in quotes. Uh, but we don't know whether she meant his father's household or his own. We don't know when Di Diana came to Samuel's home, but he reported that she gave birth in his household to four daughters between 1814 and 1819, Mary, Catherine, Jane or June, and Sally. The surname of the children as reported in the manumission records of Warwick was Caesar. I've not been able to trace any of the daughters, but I did find a Diana Caesar living in Jersey City in the 1870 census. She's listed as black, born in New Jersey about 1792. This date would be consistent with Colonel John's will and with our Diana's age at the time of her manumission in 1820. Um, an 1882 city directory, directory gives her son as friend Caesar. Uh, Diana died in 1883. So I'm excited to do more work to try to trace uh, Di Di Diana's descendants, but I do feel confident that this is Diana from the household of Samuel. I continue to work on further details about Samuel Swayze Seward as a slaveholder. Henry said there were two black women and one black boy when he was growing up. He shares no names, as is usual. In 1820, after Henry was gone away to college, the census reported the stewards living in Deer Park with seven unnamed slaves. We don't know why Samuel was there, but perhaps he was there temporarily managing his large holdings in the Minnesink patent in the western part of Orange County. Diana and Chloe and their children were likely among these enslaved persons. And we'll hear more about Chloe from Sherry Price Bruin today. There are various accounts asserting that Samuel Swayze Seward ran a fleet of sloops out of Newburgh, Newburgh, New York, carrying distilled spirits and other produce south, bringing back cotton and flax and trading as far as the West Indies. Samuel's grandson, Frederick Whittlesey Seward, shared the stunning assertion in a 1917 newspaper article from Middletown, New York, that Samuel's fleet also brought back sugar and molasses and some slaves. The slaves would have, slave trade would have been illegal at that time. My search of Samuel's papers turned up only one ship's manifest and that showed a shipment of various agricultural products belonging to Samuel. But I found no record of Samuel's ownership of any ship or a fleet of sloops. More work is needed on this aspect of his business affairs. 
with more time, I'd share the story of Seward's of relying on forced labor in other states. I could tell you the story about John Jr. who Seward, in who in 1804 allegedly tried to bury alive a pregnant young enslaved woman when she wouldn't tell him the name of the father of her child. The baby's name was Lehman's. And I'd share the story of another cousin, another Samuel Seward, uh, the people he enslaved and the pounds of cotton each of them could pick in a day. His plantation was in Independence, Texas. And just last week, through an African-American Facebook genealogy page, page, I met Fatima, a woman who appears to be my seventh cousin, descended from an enslaved woman and the great grandson of one of Mary Swayze Seward's loyalist brothers who went to Mississippi, Mississippi and became large planters in 1773. Fatima and I are also seventh cousins of Patrick Swayze. And Patrick and Fatima and I may uh, be cousins of a young man, uh, of descendants of a young man named Walter Leonard, who took his freedom with the help of Sarah Card and our cousin Israel. I hope I may meet them someday. Thank you. So thank you very much, Leah. That, that was a lot of details about how many years have you been working on that? Oh, she's muted herself. You just throw in chat. I was just curious. Uh, oh, um, I, got, I heard the story in 2013 and I started studying con uh, cert concertedly in 2014. Ah, okay. Yep. Yeah. So that's, that's how many years it takes to um, winkle out all those details that come together as the story. Thank you very much, Leah. Um, so next up, we're going to have Sherry and I, I think that um, our other participant has arrived now. So I think we're good to go. But um, the next up will, will be Sherry, Sherry Bruin, um, who I think Sherry, we first met, quote unquote, maybe about three or four years ago or something you were working. So you've been working for quite a few years on that also. A few years uh, myself yeah. on, on it. I'm gonna share my screen and you might have to walk me through getting the presentation up again, but um, okay, okay. Um, I do um, wanna just reintroduce myself again. My name is Sherry Price Berlin and my family has lived in the Goshen, Orange County area for 200 years. Um, with um, some of my fourth, up to fourth grade grandparents um, haven't been born or brought in as slaves in that area, but we've been in the same area for um, that, that long. And so I have very, a lot of generations um, from slavery uh, onto present day that are from that community with a lot of extended family. I've been a member of Ancestry.com since 2010, and I took the DNA test in 2014, and that opened up um, a lot of information for me. Not only I, my research really took off then, because I was also pairing myself with um, cousins and finding out more about the family that we have. Um, Leah mentioned Chloe Co, which I'm not going to talk about Chloe today that she's not part of my presentation, but I do want to say that um, I, my fourth great grandmother was Elizabeth Co Mason, who I believe to be Coe's sister-in-law. And that's how um, we're connected with, with that, with uh, Elizabeth being the sister of William Co, Co Chloe's husband um, there. So in researching, um, I also build my tree out sideways, which means that's adding um, siblings and cousins, in-laws, um, so that I can learn more about it. I feel that the more people that I have, I'm able to connect um, how everybody's related on here. So one of the things that I found very useful with research beyond what Ancestry has with uh, census records and maybe some church records is that wills can often give you information. From the slide to the next slide. I also go into looking for what 
information is out there, like using Google a lot to see what's already there. So when I Googled um, slave births and manumissions, I found the chart that was um, that Warwick already had that listed some slave births and the manumissions that had been done there. And so I just looked for familiar names that run in, into the family. So I do have ransoms in my family. So I was attracted by George Ransom having freed and manumitted several slaves there. Um, notably, Fanny was one that was mentioned um, in his will. So I tried to show, I hope you can see it clearly, but I, I brought in a copy of his will that mentions um, Fanny, where he says, further, I bequeath my colored servant, Fanny, the sum of $500 to be paid to her for and in consideration of her faithful service out of my real estate at the decrease of, uh, at the decease of my beloved wife, Ruth Ransom. So he died in 1845, as I generally don't search for people who died there, but that, that far because slavery was well over, um, in New York at that time, but because he had the name Ransom and I was hoping what I went into it looking for was um, Sarah Ransom, who is um, actually on my father's side of the family, but I didn't find her, but I did find Fanny Ransom and her connection to people on my mother's side of the family. So George's wife, Ruth, also mentions a black woman in her will it was a woman named Ruth um, that he met, she mentions leaving some money money to. So what I found was that, that when I found Fanny and her sister, who ended up being her sister, because Fanny's will um, identifies Ruth Garrison as her sole surviving next of kin. And so I was really delighted with that because the Garrisons are also part of my family on my mother's side of the family. Um, a couple of connections there. My uh, grandmother's uncle married a Garrison and also my uncle, my mother's brother, also married a Garrison. So I was really interested in how that came about. So I'm seeing here that in the 1850 will, there was both Francis Ransom and Ruth Ransom mentioned together. And then again, in Fanny's will, she left her whatever she had um, to her sister, Ruth Garrison. So when I built that up, I thought, well, now I learned that Ruth Garrison's maiden name was Ransom. And I took that tree and traced it all the way down to my, uncle, my grandmother's uncle, Frank, who had married Elizabeth Ransom. So I was able to take a whole line from being mentioned in the wills and identify people that were in my family. And then, so I have some research tips that I wanted to share for looking for African-Americans uh, formerly enslaved in wills. So, of course, you want to begin with your family tree, adding as many ancestors as you can. And there are different resources that are available. Ancestry.com, that's my favorite site, but it is a, you have to pay for researching there. You can also find some of the same records on familysearch.com or .org. It's free, so you can find those records there. There's also foal.com for military records and pension, and then there's the National Park Service that has um, an area where you can search for um, soldiers in the US colored troops. Also Google searches, and uh, uh, Leah mentioned Googling uh, searches and how effective they are. And that's actually how I started this research by finding that list of uh, slave births and manumissions. Then also another favorite site of mine is newspapers.com. So there's a lot of information in newspapers um, if you can find your ancestors listed. And I also use keywords for searching because sometimes the names aren't always there, but keywords, slaves, Negro, colored, mulatto, 
uh, manumit or manumission. And then to identify sla enslavers, I actually look in the census records, um, the 1800 to 1820, and look for people who owned slaves. So you'll see my little handwritten note there at the bottom, on the side, on the uh, left side, where I was listing the enslavers and how many slaves that they had. And so I'll, I'll make lists for that and then see if there's any names that seem familiar, because I have found that um, people in my family do have the same, some of the same names of people who were um, living in the Goshen and had owned slaves. Um, searching for the wills. Now, searching through the wills isn't, you know, easy because it's the handwriting can be hard to read. So you have to take your time, be patient and be diligent. The more you look at it, the more um, familiar you'll get with the style of writing, uh, especially with S's and F's and T's and stuff that sometimes those can, you know, distort how something is spelled until you get used to that style of handwriting. And then again, through the wills, um, there's a lot of repetitive language, but if you scan through the document, because it's difficult to read line by line, but look for single names, because in most of the time, if they had a slave, there was no last name, and it would just be um, that name, like Fanny, and not her whole name, or uh, my Negro, colored, black, servant, any of those words that may have been used um, during that time to describe a person of color. Just if you could search for those words that you may um, get those. But I found it very exciting, even though it takes a while to read through some of the wills and you don't always find what you're looking for. Some people have died intestate and don't have, didn't leave any uh, wills. But when you do find something, it's to me, it's just really rewarding and exciting. And so that's what I have for you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was that was helpful to me too, Sherry. Everybody, Good. everybody can hear me okay? Okay, so thank you very much. You're welcome. And um, very shortly, we're gonna have our next presenter up. And um, I was happy to see David is here. David, can you unmute yourself? Well, we do that in California. We move our mouth, but don't make any noise. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone, this is David Dolsons, who is our next presenter. Thank you so much. Uh, sure. Well, as you can see, I'm not accustomed to doing Zoom. So, well, I, I'll take a, a little different path in this discussion in that um, uh, it's, I started uh, genealogy when I retired from the California Department of Education, and I knew a lot about my mother's family because it's an immigrant family from the Azor Islands, which is Portuguese. We spoke Portuguese in the home. We had Portuguese culture and food and everything. And with that surrounding, I never thought much about my father's family. Uh, but after um, I retired, I went to the Azor Islands to visit and somebody said, where are you going to visit to honor your father's family? And I said, I don't really know. I'll have to look into it. And short story is that I start to look into it. I found out that even though I'm in California, my ancestors were in New York and I'm learning a lot of history. The Dutch were in New York. You know, in California, we, we heard this but we didn't pay attention in school, right? We had the Franciscan fathers and the missions, but you have the Dutch in New York. And um, the first thing I noticed when I looked for names in baptismal registers at the Dutch churches, there were names like uh, Portuguese names, which drew my attention. Antonio Portugues, Maria de Angola, uh, Francisco Congo. So, right away I realized that even though these were Portuguese names, they're not your average Portuguese name. My name is David Dolson Cabral. I have my father's name and my mother's name, but these people had 
made up names with really only first names and no surname. So that brought my attention to maybe my Dutch ancestors might have slaves also, but I wouldn't find that for another hundred years or so. But as I went through genealogy, the first thing I discovered it is I couldn't understand much of it without understanding more about history. You have to have context. All these words that come up, loyalists and patriots and so forth, we didn't study the Revolutionary War that closely in California. So I start paying attention to history more. And the first thing that popped up is I had a line of family that were loyalists. And I uh, go, oh my God, they were on the wrong side. But then very soon it came that I found out by looking at a census that several Dolsons had slaves. And all you see in the very earliest census is a check mark. One, two, three. No names, uh, no other identifiers, just uh, check marks to identify people who were enslaved. So I kept looking into it and finally with the help of uh, the Orange County Genealogical Society, I discovered something called the Slave Record Books. And this is a wonderful source. And for the first time I could see names, even though they were written in a way that was unfavorable to my sensitivities. And the first one I saw is my winch, so-and-so, uh, and, -so, uh, and uh, later my mulatto child and, things like this. And I look through that and what you find out is when you're looking at these data is that there's something behind the data. A mulatto child, what does that mean? That means the father was white and the mother was black, right? My winch is not my companion, my servant, it's a slave, right? referring to a woman at that time as a winch. And I began to notice very unquiety things as I looked at these records, which I'll go over in a minute. But the US census was my first clue. And then I start looking at Orange County history books like Ruttenberg and Clark, excuse the pronunciations, uh, and Eager. And uh, I also noticed they kind of copy each other a little bit in some sections, but at any rate, they had my ancestor, James Dolson, down as manumitting slaves. So I had to find out what manumission was all about. And I looked into that. The Orange County Historical Society has some nice materials that are available. And the, I think the current president of that um, society is Michelle Figlio, Figliomeni, and she wrote a book called The Flickering Flame. And it had in there a contract by James Dolson and a boy, okay? That he had a boy uh, called an indentured servant. But I thought that was a white person, but I would later find out that it wasn't a white person. So I went on and I kept looking. And uh, the, as I said, the, uh, the slave record books were uh, very enlightening. You could see the names of people, their ages, uh, trans, uh, you could find transactions, buying and selling. You can find a lot of runaway notices. In fact, in the bibliography I gave you, there's a whole book just full of runaway notices and it identifies the owners. It identifies the slaves that were running away. And it usually makes comments such as he had this mark or he was wearing my hat or uh, he took with him $2 or uh, uh, the one I like is speaks middling English, but good Dutch, you know, uh, means these slaves were around for a while, doesn't it? Because these uh, notices were running in the 1800s and uh, the Dutch uh, stopped having uh, control in New York about uh, what, 1670 or so. So the Dutch language persevered in part because of slaves were speaking it in very isolated situations and of course not getting any education right in the school system. So I found this out and uh, like I said, the manumission and you start to understand the nature of slavery. You hear about it, families being separated, 
runaways being punished and whipped. But I found out a lot of other things and a lot of other knowledge about slavery. And that's why I like uh, Sue. She named this uh, digging down and owning up. So in digging down, I found out things like uh, uh, when one child was born uh, uh, to a slave woman owned by James Dawson, the child belonged to a guy named Noah Terry. That's very disconcerting, isn't it? Because the woman had a baby, but the baby didn't belong to her or even my ancestor, it belonged to another man, right? Then I came across um, uh, these manumissions, which I thought, oh boy, New York is way ahead of some of those Southern states, right? Except in the manumission clauses, it says that the child would be born, but would remain an indentured servant for like 25 or 27 years. So manumission wasn't like, oh, you're free. You're now you're not a slave, you're called an indentured servant, but your life doesn't change much, right? Your life doesn't change all that much. And then there's little tidbits like the War of 1812. If you were a white owner, you could send your slave to do your military duty, okay? But to add insult to injury, the government paid military men, but the pay would go to the owner not to the slave, right? Uh, and to top it all off, when this happened during the Civil War, of course, by then New York was uh, had moved out of slavery, but the South put a death penalty on any black soldiers uh, that were captured. They didn't go to the uh, prison camps, which were bad enough, right? But they were often executed uh, because they were black. So you find out the more you dig in, kind of the worse all that slavery business was. And then I start looking at, besides my family, who else owns slaves? And uh, maybe Sue will correct me on this because I'm not that familiar with local history. But in my view, just perusing it, it was the rich and famous who owned slaves. You had to have money to own slaves. And often those were also the most famous people around. In fact, they became legislators. I think uh, you have a famous one there called uh, after the library, uh, Wisner or Wisner. They had slaves. Uh, Hasbrook, another very historic name for that area. Of course, they had slaves and I could go down, but uh, money and uh, fame were highly correlated with holding slaves. Now in New York, Holding slaves was a lot different than the South, I think, because there were, the numbers were fewer. In my family, never more than five was ever noted on any document. But uh, uh, I think some uh, bigger properties may have had some more, but they certainly weren't like the plantations in the South and so forth that had 150 or whatever. Um, once I found this out, I felt very disconcerted and I wanted to know more. And the first thing I wanted to know is what did my ancestors know about what they were doing? You know, it's hard to judge the past with the present. So I start taking a look at that. And first of all, like I mentioned, uh, the slave owners were wealthy. That means they're probably the most educated in the communities. So they had knowledge about things and they were literate. So that means they knew things. The clergy from the very beginning that slavery started in the Americas spoke out against it. But Sue brought to my attention that on the other hand, there were some religious bodies that said, we accept this because it's God's way, right? God wants the world to be this way. There's masters and slaves and we're not necessarily against it. We may not even, we may not like it, but we're not necessarily against it. There were other religious groups, however, that wouldn't allow their members to be involved and spoke against it. And that's where you have the rise of the abolitionists. According to one source, the first abolitionist society in New York was 1688. 
that's very, very early, isn't it? Um, so people were uh, pushing freedom for African Americans as early as 1688 in an organized way. Um, and then of course, uh, these organizations came bigger, uh, they grew, uh, they uh, ran articles, they wrote books, the newspaper ran, uh, would run debates and so forth. Um, my ancestors that they could read, they would see all those runaway notices. And in fact, they put in a few notices themselves, right? So uh, they knew that slavery was so bad that people were running away all the time. You don't stay, you don't run away if things are satisfactory. And even with all the dangers of running away, the chances of punishment and even death, uh, it wasn't infrequent in New York to see all these runaway um, uh, notices in the newspapers. Now, when I look at that, I, I come to the only conclusion, uh, my personal conclusion is my family knew a lot about it. And uh, uh, I regret that the whole episode happened, and I regret that it, uh, my family was involved. There's no other way around it. This is the way it was, and this is the true history. And for all European Americans, I don't call myself white, I'm a European American because that's my ethnicity, Portuguese and Dutch. But uh, Europeans, Americans who did hold slaves, um, uh, if you try to nudge it or leave it out of your ancestry, uh, I think it's an unauthentic way. And I think African-Americans notice uh, when their compatriots uh, behave in these ways and it only uh, engenders more resentment that we don't acknowledge what happened and we don't uh, make an accurate statement uh, about it. 